It's a big topic, competition and monopoly. It's been at the center of economics for a long, long time. And uh, what I'm going to try to do for the most part in, in the time I have is, uh, is uh, tell you about the Austrian theory of competition and monopoly. And uh, I guess the first thing I'll do is recommend a few readings. Uh, if you want to read up some basic, real basic readings on this, there's, there's a lot of literature. Uh, one article is, uh, that I would recommend is by uh, Friedrich Hayek. It's called The Meaning of Competition, and it's in his book that he edited entitled Individualism and Economic Order. It's a good, it's a good summary of the Austrian view of competition. And then uh, in Man, Economy, and State by Murray Rothbard, Chapter 10 on, on Monopoly and Competition, is also uh, really uh, excellent and indispensable in understanding the Austrian view of competition. And uh, you really have, it's hard to pick any one chapter out of Man, Economy, and State out of context, sort of. And you, you sort of have to read Chapter 9 first, uh, and, and hopefully 1 through 8 also. But, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's also recommended. Uh, an excellent book that talks about not only uh, competition and monopoly theory, but it's mostly uh, case studies of uh, anti-monopoly policy or antitrust policy. But it, there's also a, a really good summary of the Austrian viewpoint on competition and monopoly in it. It's antitrust and monopoly, anatomy of a policy failure. And uh, that's for sale out front also. Uh, a real classic in this area is uh, Israel Kersner, Competition and Entrepreneurship. And then to, uh, to uh, uh, blow my own horn, uh, an article that I published with Jack High called Antitrust and Competition Historically Considered was in a journal called Economic Inquiry in July of 88, when a lot of you were still in uh, elementary school or, or not even in elementary school, you know, thinking, dreaming of elementary school back, back then. But, but those are just some, uh, you know, as an introduction to the Austrian view of competition, and, uh, and how it differs from the mainstream or uh, so-called neoclassical view. And so what I thought I'd do first is uh, give you a definition, not my definition, of how uh, uh, Austrians generally think of competition as a, as a dynamic, ongoing, rivalrous, entrepreneurial discovery process that facilitates planned coordination between market participants. That's sort of in a nutshell, uh, I think, uh, uh, encapsules uh, the essence of the Austrian view of competition as being an ongoing process. And it involves a rivalry, which involves, in turn, such things as price cutting, product differentiation, innovation, uh, mergers, in, in, a, in an attempt to figure out what the optimal scale of a plant or, or a, a business should be the mergers or divestitures, you know, the mergers don't always work out. And so it's a rivalrous ongoing process, and the entrepreneur is a key figure in, in competition. The entrepreneur is always alert to profit opportunities and, and, and trying to fulfill needs of consumers that others have not uh, fulfilled yet. Uh, and he, he's a risk taker. And it basically, this is, it facilitates planned coordination between buyers and sellers. And the more intense is competition, uh, the more coordination occurs in the economy, uh, the more co coordination occurs. And this, this is basically the view of Adam Smith, and then it was adopted by the Austrian school once there was an Austrian school. And this view of competition is, is sort of the average person's view of competition. When you see sales, price cutting, the invention of new products, uh, and so forth, uh, you see this, it's, it's the average, average person on the street, so to speak. Uh, this was all superseded, though, in the economics profession, beginning, I think, around the 1920s and 30s. Uh, before that, uh, the Austrian view of competition prevailed. Uh, one of the studies I did uh, once was uh, uh, on the question, this article of mine I mentioned from Economic Inquiry, of, of how did it come into being that economists uh, were once, once almost all Austrians in terms of how they thought of competition in the marketplace. And, uh, but by the 1930s, um, that theory was uh, replaced by the so-called perfect competition model that's in all the textbooks and still in all the textbooks to this day. And so uh, and I, I did a study of um, what economists were saying about the big merger wave of the 1880s and 1890s. It was the first big corporate merger wave in America. 
And uh, believe it or not, there were only 10 men who actually had full-time jobs as economists in, in the 1880s. So you're able to survey the entire population of the economics profession and what the, pretty easily and what they had to say about this. And, uh, and almost to the, to the man, there was, there was a 9 out of 10 thought that this was perfectly consistent with competition and, uh, and they viewed competition as an ongoing rivalrous process. And besides that, what they were observing is in the aftermath of these mergers, they were seeing prices going down. They were seeing in the oil industry, the steel industry, the steel rails industry, they saw these mergers taking place and there were fewer firms, but they saw declining prices and a lot of times they saw new products springing up that did not exist five years ago or ten years ago. So they thought this was all a natural evolutionary process of competition and it was nothing to worry about. And the economics profession was pretty much unanimously opposed to antitrust policy. At the time, the first antitrust law was passed in 1890. Uh, the, the whole profession uh, was against it. Even Richard T. Ely, who was one of the co-founders of the American Economic Association, and uh, I guess we could, you would call him a socialist. I don't know if he actually called himself a socialist, but if you read his readings, he was a socialist. Uh, the, the founding document of the American Economic Association, by the way, uh, denounced uh, capitalism as uh, uh, unsound in morals and unsafe in practice, I think, something to that, to that effect. You could probably look it up on the web. And Richard T. Ely was the, the, uh, the author of that. But even he was in, uh, saw no problem with uh, the corporate mergers that were occurring at the time because he held this view of competition. So even, even socialists like uh, Ely uh, held this view. And then, of course, as I said, it was all supplanted by the perfect competition model and uh, that model uh, looks at competition as an, uh, an end state, E-N-D, an end state, rather than a process. And it begins, uh, as you all know, if you, any of you have taken uh, principles of microeconomics, it defines competition in a very different way. Uh, and, it, and basically it concentrates on these basic assumptions behind the so-called competitive model that uh, most or all of you have seen before in your studies. Uh, homogeneous products, everyone produces the same thing, homogeneous prices, everyone uh, charges the same price in the industry, many firms so that no one firm can have any significant effect on pricing by altering its uh, supply, perfect information uh, about what consumers want and how to supply it to them, and free or costless entry and exit into and out of industries. Those are the basic assumptions in all, all the textbooks. And originally those assumptions were, were made up uh, in an attempt to ape or imitate the physical sciences uh, and to create a theory where the, the assumptions, yes, are unrealistic, but the idea was to try to focus on price competition. It really is a theory of price competition alone and doesn't say much about any other kind of competition. It's a theory of price competition. And there are uses to that model. You, uh, you, you know, like I said, you've all seen it. Now, the whole idea of, uh, you know, one industry earning uh, exceptional profits will draw entry into it, and that drives the price down, and, and output expands. That whole story, the model explains that perfectly. It's a good, it's a good model to understand, you know, base, the dynamics there of that, that one aspect of how markets work. But it's created tremendous mischief and misunderstanding about how real-world markets operate in the view of, of all the Austrian economists. And let me give you one example. Um, in, in the United States, uh, in 1948, Paul Samuelson published his, his book, uh, Economics, Principles of Economics book. And it was by far the biggest seller until about the 1980s. And not only was it the biggest seller, I think as of that time, he sold about 4 million copies of it. Uh, but almost all the other books were clones of Samuelson's book. And so Paul Samuelson totally dominated the uh, teaching of uh, economics to college students from 1948 to, to 1978, cl clearly. And then some, co some competition uh, came into being about, about that point. But uh, I wanted to show you what generations of students, not only American students, but all over the world, anyone who studied economics probably used this book. And unfortunately, uh, I think only a few of you in the front row, if that, might be able to see this. Maybe, maybe none of you, I don't know. There are a lot of old people in the front row. I don't know if you can be able to see this or not, but these guys here. But, uh, but this is uh, just one page from uh, Samuelson's book. 
Uh, this is the 1976 edition that I just went upstairs and grabbed off the shelf. And, uh, and he's talking, this is what students were taught about how competitive the American economy was. And I'll read just parts of this. He, goes, he has a whole list of uh, products, uh, razor blades, toothpaste, steel, aluminum, potatoes, wheat, cigarettes, tobacco, nylon, and cotton. He says, now, which, which of these would fit into our definition of a competitive industry? Remember, he's saying the definition is perfect information, homogeneous products, homogeneous prices, costless entry and exit. Uh, well, neither aluminum nor steel meets the definition. Um, See, so what about steel? United States Steel and Bethlehem are the industry giants. Together with Republic Steel, Jones and Lachlan, and a few others uh, that constitute uh, little steel, they produce a large fraction of the total market, so they don't qualify. It's true that one plant's steel output may be much like another's, but it's not true that Bethlehem and Republic are so weak that each could never depress the price of steel by throwing on the market as much as it could comfortably produce. So steel doesn't count. He says, when you go down the list, you will find that only potatoes, tobacco, wheat, and cotton come within our strict definition of perfect competition. So that's it. Uh, potatoes, uh, tobacco, wheat, and cotton are perfectly competitive industries. Everything else, uh, and, and he's not limiting himself to just these things he listed. He's, he's, he's insinuating here that pretty much everything else is imperfectly competitive. And then the next section of the book is on monopoly and imperfect competition. And so uh, generations of students are pretty much taught that, well, there are a few examples in agriculture of competition in America, but everything else is monopolistic in one way or another. And then if everything else is monopolistic in one way or another, uh, well, then we need government to come in and regulate and, uh, and to try to force it in the direction of, uh, of perfect competition. But even this is uh, harebrained, his, his list of, of items, uh, agricultural products, at the time he wrote this, we, we had had decades and decades of government programs that paid farmers to not grow wheat, acreage uh, allotments that forced them to restrict the amount of planting they could uh, do to push up the price of wheat, uh, price supports on cotton and tobacco and other things. And so these were uh, highly monopolistic uh, industries because of government policy. And here's uh, Paul Samuelson uh, holding them up as the stellar examples of competition. And so, so even his list is, uh, is just wrong, even by his own, uh, by anybody's definition. And so generations of students were, were grossly miseducated about, about the meaning of competition here, uh, unless, and this was before the Mises Institute was founded, and so there was no salvation. You people are here <laughs> to be saved, and so, uh, and so, uh, so, and you're very lucky about that. And so, and so, and so if you look at, at this theory, uh, in the Hayek article that I mentioned, uh, uh, The Meaning of Competition, one of his uh, little slogans there is, is this, quote, in perfect competition there is no competition, end quote. And it's really true. If you think of these assumptions, they rule out any real competition. Homogeneous prices, well, real businesses compete by cutting prices. They have sales. They do that. Homogeneous products, real businesses compete by, uh, by struggling to tailor their products to the preferences of consumers. And in, uh, in today's world, uh, consumer preferences in, in more affluent societies change. They change uh, more rapidly than they used to even. And I'm going to give you some, some uh, data on that. It's uh, some pretty interesting data. And so, uh, and so if you look at that, just that assumption, the homogeneous products assumption, uh, it doesn't seem to, to make much sense. In fact, here's a uh, Here's some uh, statistics that were provided on this assumption, the homogeneous product assumption, by the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. You know, we're not too fond of quoting Fed, Federal Reserve bureaucrats here, but there happens to be a sort of a, uh, a spy in the, within the Fed. His name is Michael Cox. He's a free market economist, and he, he does do some pretty good work, and miraculously they publish it. Uh, the, Fed, the Fed does. And one of the things uh, he did was he uh, oversaw the publication of the 1998 annual report of the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. And it was all about the phenomenon of what economists call mass customization, using mass production, combining computer technology and mass production technology to tailor make products of all kinds for everybody. You know, nowadays, if you want to buy a new car, you can go online pick out the kind of car you want and all the gadgets and all the special effects that you want in the car, you know, hit the, hit the, uh, the mouse 
and uh, click the mouse, and uh, within a week, your car will be here. You can even finance it on. You, you don't even have to leave your chair. You could finance the car online, too, if you want to finance it. And so, uh, and this, art, this report was about this phenomenon of increased uh, product variety. And I wrote down uh, the table that I have has very small print, so I don't want to, nobody would be able to see it, uh, especially the old guys in the front row here. And so I didn't want to make you go blind. But I just wrote down a few of the things that they have in there. Uh, pasta, in, in the bad old days of 1980, only 79 varieties of pasta. How did we ever live uh, like that? 561 in, by 90, 1998. Potato chips, how did we ever get along with only 46 brands of potato chips versus 166 beer? How did, how did I ever get out of college with only 25 varieties of beer uh, as opposed to 187 by 1998, it's probably uh, 18,000 by now. Uh, wine, only 22 brands of wine in 1980, 252 by 98. Dog food, a 58 versus 180. Um, this is a list of, I picked out of their big long list, things that uh, in my familiarity is what uh, college students consume. So that's why I... Uh, these are the, that's, that's the fraternity guys, and the, and the fraternity initiation. Uh, cookies, 127 versus 396. Sport utility vehicles, only eight in 1980, 38 by 90, 1998. Cereals, more than twice as many brands of breakfast cereals, and on and on and on it goes. And uh, the explanation of this is that be, because of the integration of computers and manufacturing technology, and the, uh, the quickening pace of the change in consumer preferences in, a, in a more affluent societies like the U.S., uh, competition has led to this result of this uh, increased variety. Increased variety it means more competition. It's totally, totally the opposite of, the old, uh, of, of what the, theory, uh, the old theory of perfect competition says is desirable, homogeneous products in an ideal world. And uh, among the, there's a lot of mischief, uh, policy mischief that's been uh, perpetrated by economists taking these assumptions too seriously. And uh, they were only really originally uh, meant to be a theoretical foil. They weren't really meant to be implemented in policy, uh, but they were. They, they were. they were accepted like that uh, in, in the real world. Uh, there's a famous case, those of us who have studied antitrust and monopoly, policy in the U.S. anyway, there's a famous case that economists know about as the, uh, the cereals case. This was in the 1970s. And uh, the three big cereal, dry cereal manufacturers, General Mills, General Foods, and Kellogg's, had captured, I think, about 70% of the dry cereal market by then. They had, they had won that, about that much of market share. And so the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, D.C., sued them for violating the antitrust laws merely on the fact that they had a, a large market share, 70%. And this was, uh, the, the economist in charge of this was a Harvard economist named Frederick Scherer, who at the time uh, was, uh, had the best-selling book on the, in the field of industrial organization. And he was at, on leave from Harvard at the Federal Trade Commission at the time. And they spent several years litigating this case. Uh, and what happened was uh, Scherer invented the theory of what he called shared monopoly, he, he claimed that these companies were sharing a monopoly through what, the tactic of brand proliferation. Brand with a D on it, not brand. Brand, I guess there was brand proliferation too, but there's a... So, what, so what, what, what they said they were doing, these companies, you know, there were more than three companies producing dry cereal, but these three began to experiment. They had the idea, the light bulb went off in the head, that people might like more than just cornflakes. Maybe we should try something else put chocolate on cornflakes or, you know, or whatever. And, and, and quite a few of these products caught on. And so the ones that caught on gave them a big market share. Their competitors who just sat still, didn't innovate, and, uh, and weren't as innovative as these three companies lost market share. And so, uh, and that of course is bad. We're supposed to punish that. And so this, the theory of brand proliferation was invented. And it cost the cereal companies many millions of dollars and many, uh, thousands of hours of, of, of time of the executives of these companies to deal with this as opposed to uh, trying to figure out how to produce even better products. Uh, and the cereal companies eventually won. And uh, to, I could paraphrase what the, the judge said in the case. Uh, you know, he recognized, he recognized that uh, 
you can eat more than just cereal in the morning. And he's, I think there was one quote from him saying, uh, I don't even like cereal. I eat bacon and eggs in the morning. So, you know, even if they did have some sort of monopoly in dry cereal, there are a lot of substitutes for dry cereal. And so, therefore, they would not have been able to price uh, like a monopoly would price according to the textbook model of monopoly. And so, but still, with the antitrust cases like that, when you win, you still lose because you spend millions of dollars and your company is tied up uh, with lawyers and, and courts and judges for years and years uh, with regard to this. This was also the heart of uh, the theory of monopolistic competition. Uh, one of the revolutions in, in economics in the 20th century was in the 30s, the monopolistic competition revolution. Uh, and there were two economists, Edward Chamberlain, two British economists, and Joan Robinson, who wrote uh, essentially the same book around the same time uh, on monopolistic competition. Uh, they said, well, okay, they begrudgingly admitted that uh, in, in most industries you do see many firms, so that fits the perfect competition assumption. Uh, but they seem to differentiate the products and produce different stuff. Uh, Goodyear tires are a little different than good rich tires, for example. So therefore, each, each and every company is a monopoly because they're producing some unique product that is not exactly identical to everybody else. And even if they don't produce a slightly different product with, uh, you know, maybe the, the white rim around a tire is that wide on good rich and that wide on Goodyear monopoly, different product. Uh, even if they don't produce a physically different product, through advertising, they can create the image in the minds of the consumers that their product is different, and that establishes a monopoly. So you have this oxymoron of monopolistic competition. It's kind of like jumbo shrimp or uh, military intelligence, it, you know, uh, uh, monopolistic competition. And, uh, and that was a revolution in economics because, like Samuelson, it, it enabled uh, economists to say, uh, every industry is imperfect. You know, the government must step in and regulate just about every industry. And uh, the economist Harold Demsetz, the UCLA economist Harold Demsetz, who, who I have accused of being a closet Austrian. He, he never admitted to being an Austrian, but he, he, he did a lot of really good work in the field of industrial organization. And what was good about it was he, uh, he it reintroduced into the economics profession the idea of dynamic markets, competition as an evolutionary process over time. And not, not to the Austrians, he didn't reintroduce it to the Austrians, but to the rest of the profession. But he, he had coined a phrase uh, known as the nirvana fallacy. And he said, you know, this whole body of literature on imperfect competition, what it basically does is it holds out this model of perfect competition that is never attainable. It would never, it would never be possible in any world uh, that you could imagine to attain this, to have markets be like this. And then you look at the actual markets and you say, aha, they failed. They don't meet this, this ideal of perfect competition, of nirvana. They're not like heaven on earth. They're not like nirvana. Therefore, the government must step in and force them to be like heaven on earth, like nirvana. And he, he pretty much said, well, this is silly. It's ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's, we're wasting our time. What, what are we learning about markets by, by saying they're not all heaven on earth? You know. Who would ever, uh, in, a, in a sane world, expect them to be like nirvana, heaven on earth? Uh, it, it, especially this definition of heaven on earth, perfect, uh, you know, homogeneous products, homogeneous prices, and so forth. That's ridiculous. And so a lot of this, uh, to this day, a lot of the theorizing and economics about an industrial organization uh, commits the nirvana fallacy. All the whole, all the market failure, failure literature, so, so-called, commits this. Uh, the many firms assumption, if you look at that, that assumption, like I said, the economists of the late 19th century didn't see any problem with the fact that there were fewer firms in industry. Uh, this is an arbitrary assumption uh, to fit the theory. And so what happened was American economists especially and British economists started condemning markets as monopolistic even though the markets themselves had not changed. The theory had changed. So the exact same markets that they would look at you know, in the year 1900 as being, well, these are competitive. We see prices falling. We see innovation. We see new products being invented. Uh, Twenty years later, the same thing was happening, but they were saying, oh, these are all failing. Because why? Well, we've changed our definition of, of uh, competition from the Austrian-oriented definition to perfect competition. And so uh, in, in my paper in Economic Inquiry, I, I, I quote one popular textbook author as using the word glorious 
to describe the meaning of this for the economics profession. It was glorious because they could, they could uncover market failure everywhere. And uh, the late George Stigler, who was quite the cynic, uh, once said about this that they also discovered that they can make a good living as antitrust consultants at the, at the same time as, as inventing theories of shared monopoly and things like that. They get pretty well paid for doing these things. But, uh, but if you look at uh, the market as a, as a dynamic rivalrous process, uh, you know, fewer firms is not necessarily a bad thing uh, at all. What usually happens, of course, is with, with mergers is uh, uh, there might be economies of scale. Uh, and so uh, lower cost is often the result. And one good example, in my opinion, of um, how the Austrians look at mergers and, and how they result in fewer firms versus uh, the mainstream or what's known as the neoclassical view is there's a book published by Scherer, the same guy I mentioned, Frederick Scherer and David Kammershen, published probably about 15 years ago, I think. And they had a very large sample of uh, corporate mergers in America. I think their sample was over 500 corporate mergers through several decades. Uh, and these were uh, in the United States. And they were both working at the Federal Trade Commission at the time. And what they found was that for about half of these corporate mergers, within 10 years, uh, one of the companies was spun off or sold off. And so these companies decided, well, it didn't work. Uh, we thought if we bought this company, this merger, I mean, we two companies merged, that it would make us more competitive, we would make more money, but we didn't. So they split, they divested. They look at this as saying, we need stricter regulation of corporate mergers by smart bureaucrats like us who, before this happens, can prohibit these mergers. Because look at what a waste of, of resources. All this money that goes into these corporate mergers, and what, for what? We don't get better products and lower prices after all. And that, that of course, is a grand example of what uh, Hayek called the pretense of knowledge, the, the, the very idea that two government bureaucrats with no financial stake in a company could foresee what will happen in 10 years and, and order that company to merge or not to merge is so highly pretentious that it should be laughed out of, out of any room uh, that, or that argument is made. But of course it's not. These people are held, they get endowed chairs at Ivy League schools and uh, advisors to the Federal Trade Commission and, and the Council of Economic Advisors and, and so forth. But it's, it's uh, what Hayek called the pretense of knowledge. That, that's, that was the title of his Nobel Prize uh, uh, speech, by the way. It was in the American Economic Review, uh, when was that, about 1975, I think it was, uh, if, you, if you ever wanted to look it up. And so, uh, and so that's, that's, but what, the way the Austrians would look at it is the only way to find out or to discover what the optimum scale of plant is, is to let the market reveal that information to us. So the, the process of competition is, is how the information about how to best serve consumers is revealed. It's through the process, the dynamic rivalrous process of competition. But with a perfect uh, competition model, this information is assumed to exist. It's assumed to exist. It's an example of the old economist joke where, uh, where the man uh, had lost his watch on one side of the street, but he was looking for it on the other side of the street. And he's asked, why are you looking over there for your watch when you know it's over here? And he says, well, the light is better over there. So that's, that's where he's looking for his watch. That's, that's how economists sometimes op operate uh, with, with his, his theorizing. And so um, the perfect information uh, assumption, uh, if we look at the perfect information assumption of the competitive model, what do you suppose that would say about advertising? If, if the ideal market is, uh, is one where there's perfect information about what consumers want, among other things. So of course you wouldn't need advertising if in an ideal world. And I think this has led to a lot of suspicion of advertising as a potentially monopolizing uh, device as opposed to a competitive advice, device. And, uh, and you don't have to be an Austrian economist to, uh, to, uh, to think this is a fishy idea. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of the Chicago School economists did some kind of neat work on this uh, years ago. Uh, Dempsey's again. Uh, one of the things that I've read uh, probably 25 years ago of Harold Dempsey's, uh, one of his uh, popular articles, uh, it was noticing that uh, the Holiday Inn's uh, hotel chain had uh, joined forces with some environmental groups 
to, uh, in, in other words, had given money to the Sierra Club or some of these environmental groups to uh, finance a campaign to ban roadside billboards. They, they said these big billboards on the interstates are very unsightly and they ruin the natural beauty of America when you're driving down the highway and you see the billboard that says uh, Motel 6, $19. We can't have, that's a bad idea, it's ugly. Shouldn't, shouldn't have that. And uh, old Dempsey used just simple economic logic and said, well, you know, a hotel chain like Holiday Inns has a brand name. You know what you're going to get. It's been around for such a long time. You know you're going to get a reasonably clean room with not too many roaches, uh, a swimming pool filled with children and other sort of nasty things, <laughs> a, a very bad lounge singer, and stale donuts for about $69. Uh, and so you, you know what you're going to get. If you're traveling, that's what you're going to get, $69. You pull off, you stay, sleep overnight at hotel at the Holiday Inn. Uh, but uh, but you might want, you know, if, if all you want is a clean bed and a shower, $19 sounds a lot better at Motel 6. But how would you ever know that Motel 6 is at exit 82 if there's no billboard telling you, get off exit 82, Motel 6, $19. And so obviously the restriction on advertising would be a barrier to entry, a barrier to competition. Not not advertising. Advertising is not anti-competitive. It's, it's the restrictions on advertising that are anti-competitive. And there have been uh, quite a few other studies. Uh, a man named Lee Benham did an, one of the early ones, one of the first ones. He found that uh, uh, in the United States at, in the 1970s, about half the states allowed optometrists to advertise, and about half the states did not allow optometrists to advertise. So he thought he had sort of a natural experiment there, kind of like the physical sciences, to, to look at uh, the effects of bans on advertising by eye doctors. And um, you know, what he essentially found, it was an econometric study, he was surprised that uh, those eye doctors that are allowed to advertise, all other things equal, charge lower prices for glasses than, than, the, than were in the states where you, you couldn't advertise. And there have been other story, another neat little study by uh, a, uh, an economist named Amahai Glazer in Economic Inquiry. He uh, looked at the effect of uh, a newspaper strike in New York City on grocery prices. He found that, uh, uh, he theorized that, uh, you know, the main way of uh, shopping for groceries is the newspapers. People look at, you know, what's coffee going for and what's ground beef going for this versus that market. Uh, but there was a, a citywide newspaper strike. This was long before the Internet. And, uh, and uh, so what he found was that during the newspaper strike where there was a, not a ban on advertising but a serious reduction in advertising with groceries, uh, grocery prices shot up, and then uh, once the grocery strike was over, prices went back down to where they were or, or below where, where they were, and that's consistent with the idea that it's really bans on advertising that, uh, that are anti-competitive, not, uh, not advertising itself. And so, so this assumption of the competitive model, the perfect information assumption, assumption has caused lots of mischief, as I said also, from from Federal Trade Commission cases of suing companies for brand proliferation uh, or stopping mergers. It's, it's all the pretense of knowledge. It's all the, this notion that some bureaucrats or some economists know what the optimal structure of industry should be or what the product should look like. Uh, and and it's, just, it's just not true. Uh, the final uh, assumption that I wrote down here, the free entry and exit, well, that that just uh, presumes, doesn't it, that scarcity doesn't exist. How, nothing is free. Uh, so economic scarcity always exists. That's why we study microeconomics. Uh, that's why we study economics. Uh, you know, one, one of the reasons, and anyway. And so that, that sort of violates the basic the assumption number one of and all the economics textbooks. Um, another piece of mischief that, that is perpetrated here is in the monopoly model. It's in all the textbooks in, in the measurement of monopoly. In uh, beginning, probably beginning, the first article that I'm aware of was by Arnold Harberger in 1954. Uh, Arnold Harberger is a Chicago school economist. Uh, some of you might know of him as the famous uh, case of some of his students went to Chile and convinced Pinochet uh, in, the, in, the, was in the 70s the to uh, reduce tariffs and privatize uh, the wine industry and things like that. Uh, those were Harberger's students. His wife is from Chile, and that's how they made that connection. But, but he did one of the very first studies of what's called the social cost of monopoly. 
And, uh, and these studies are all basically the same. Here's, here's the standard monopoly diagram. It says with, with a downward sloping demand curve and marginal revenue curve, you know, the monopoly will, will equate marginal revenue to marginal cost. Uh, it will charge all the market will bear at the monopoly price PM, and it, and it will uh, produce this quantity of QM. Uh, compared to if this were a competitive industry, marginal cost would essentially be the same as this would be the sum of the marginal cost curves. It would be the supply curve, and that would be the competitive level of output. So it is said that uh, the standard neoclassical model uh, monopolists reduce or restrict output from QC to QM, and what that does is it creates this. Uh, this is not this is not something to write with. It creates this this area here, which is called the deadweight loss. It's a loss in consumer surplus uh, that doesn't exist. The consumer gets no benefit, no value from st things that are not produced, not sold in the market. And, and there have been a lot of studies uh, trying to uh, to. Uh, estimate how big this is. Harberger uh, originally came up with a very tiny number, like one-tenth of one percent of GDP, and then other studies have come up with bigger numbers, eight percent or something like that. And it, it all, they all have to uh, make assumptions about, uh, about certain things. You know, the, the, there's a difference between price, and this would be the competitive price here, PC. So the, the, the price, there's going to be a price differential there. That is something, and that's how you would measure the profit, the monopoly profit, uh, by the way, so the difference between price and average cost. But what all, what all these studies do is they use data, usually from the U.S. Department of Commerce data, that is gathered on prices and uh, cost. They get cost data from various sources. Uh, they estimate demand curves based on uh, estimates, estimate, estimation of uh, price elasticity of demand. So they can get a, an idea of what this demand curve actually looks like, how it's sloped, and so forth. But when they do these studies, they have to make a crucial assumption. They have to assume that on the day when the government bureaucrats gathered that data on cost and price and so, so forth, this industry was in long-run equilibrium because this is an equilibrium model. And that is, if there's a profit here that's an above-average profit, they have to assume that that profit has been persisting for a while and that that industry is in long-run equilibrium because the theory says that's what a monopoly profit is. It's a profit that persists above average profit and competition does not come in to reduce the price and eliminate that above average profit. And so they just assume that if they find a divergence between price and average cost here, in the, like in this model, that it, it is a long-run equilibrium divergence between price and average cost. It's not just a disequilibrium uh, divergence between price and, and cost. Uh, but there's no reason in the world to, to, to think that is true because the natural state of things is disequilibrium. Markets are constantly in flux, uh, much more than they are in some static uh, sense. And these authors even admit this. Some of the studies that, that, you, that you can read, and if anybody is really interested in this, I can give you references later. But there was one study by Stephen Littlechild in the Economic Journal some years ago where he comes right out and said, of course, uh, we know that we are measuring in our estimation of profits here, we're measuring normal competitive profits as well as possible monopoly profits, but we're going to count them all as monopoly profits anyway because that will give us a bigger number and we can publish our paper that way. And so they actually say that in the papers, in the, in the, in the journal. So they're saying we're being dishonest and deceitful but that's all right because uh, we can get away with it, and so and, and they do. Uh, Harberger said the same thing in his uh, in his in his article, and so so if you assume this mo model is uh, static, like the model is, it's an equilibrium model. It tells you a very different story about any market than if you look at these markets historically uh, as constantly changing over time. And so that's that's another source of, of major mischief out there. Now, Murray Rothbard, uh, if, if you read his chapter, I encourage everybody to read his chapter 10 in Man, Economy, and State, uh, along with anything else you read on the topic of monopoly and competition. And, uh, and he made several really trenchant points there that you won't find anywhere else uh, in, in the mainstream literature. And, and one of the things, you know, you're all economic students, and you're all probably familiar with the concept of consumer sovereignty. And, of course, that's one of the great things about markets, about the free market. Uh, the consumer is king, 
in human action, von Mises uh, has one, one of my favorite passages is about how he, he writes about how the consumers uh, don't care a whit for, for anybody else but themselves. And if, if they can find one product that is just marginally better than the one they've been buying, they'll dump the old producer and, and do business with the new person, even if it means the unemployment of hundreds of people. Uh, he calls them cold-hearted and callous, you know, or us. He calls us cold-hearted and callous, which is certainly true. The consumer uh, really controls uh, what goes on in markets. But uh, in the context of this monopoly diagram, you know, this deadweight loss is a deadweight loss to consumers in this particular diagram of the cost, cost industry that I, I just uh, drew up there. And uh, Murray asked the question, well, why are we dwelling so much on consumer sovereignty? Shouldn't we think in terms of individual sovereignty? Why, why is it necessarily a good thing to have the government, for example, step in and force down the price of this thing uh, that would harm the producer and benefit the consumer? Why is that necessarily a good thing? Uh, why, uh, does the producer have no, no property rights? Uh, because, uh, because after all, we're talking about price controls here. You could call it antitrust policy, but it's price controls. And what do price controls do? Well, they, they abridge the property rights of the property owner, whoever owns the business. They're taking money away from him. And one, one, of the, one of the first uh, price control laws in America that was held to be constitutional was uh, two brothers in Illinois named Munn, M-U-N-N, -N, who uh, ran a grain storage business. And uh, they, they, they charged farmers a certain fee for grain storage. And previous to this, this was 1877, the year 1877. Previous to this, the United States uh, judicial system had been fairly friendly to property rights and has struck down a lot of different pro uh, price control laws as being, uh, uh, as being too interfering with property rights and contracts, uh, violating the contract clause of the United States Constitution. But this was a, a sea change that occurred here. And all that happened was the, the legislature of Illinois came by and, and decided that, well, the farmers have a lot of political clout. They want price controls. They want to pay the Munn brothers less than what they're paying. And we're going to pass a law forcing them to charge less for their grain storage business. And that was held to be constitutional uh, for the first time in, a, in, in, in many, many court cases over, over price controls. And so they, they essentially robbed the Munn brothers legally, legal plunder with price control. And so Murray Rothbard asked the question, well, why is this form of legal plunder desirable? And why this fetish over consumer sovereignty? Uh, why, why don't we think in terms of individual sovereignty? Everybody is sovereign. Everyone has rights to their own peacefully acquired property. And so, uh, you know, why does the, cons in the name of the consumer, should the government step in and, and, and rob producers like this uh, with fancy sounding names like antitrust policy, something like that, is, call, it, call it that. And, and that is certainly a good point. And uh, the, the sort of the fetish over consumer sovereignty is always uh, imploring us to drop prices, to do something that will drop prices. Uh, and uh, Murray asked the question, well, what, how far should we drop the price? Zero? Is, should we have a zero price? Is that, is that the optimal price? Uh, uh, which, which is a good uh, question. Uh, another point he makes is that, uh, you know, in all the textbooks, you know, we're told uh, correctly that a monopoly price uh, will, you know, the monopoly model says that the monopolist will operate in the inelastic portion of the demand curve. If, if, they're, if they're operating in the inelastic portion of the demand curve and they raise their price, uh, then they'll increase revenue uh, because they won't lose many sales. It's inelastic demand and they're making more money. They're charging more per unit of, of sale. And uh, Murray uh, Rothbard uh, made the argument that, uh, well, if consumers really did disapprove of being plundered by a monopolist or exploited by a monopolist, what could they do? What can you do if, if, you're, if it's a private monopolist in the, in the world of neoclassical economics? If, uh, if they're in the inelastic portion of their demand curve and the, and the so-called monopolist raises his price, and this is said to be bad for consumers. What, well, what can what what can you do? What can you as a consumer do? You just not buy it. Yeah, you could you could, you could even organize a boycott if you wanted if you know if you wanted to. And so, if consumers leave and don't buy that particular product, what happens to the elasticity of demand? What's that? 
uh, well, it becomes larger. I mean, it becomes more elastic. I mean, that's sort of the definition of elasticity of demand is that uh, there's a bigger consumer response to higher prices. They, they leave. And so uh, and that, that sort of foils the whole, the whole plot uh, of, uh, of being a monopolist operating in the inelastic portion of the demand curve. And so uh, uh, Murray's reasoning was that uh, if you have a situation like this where there's inelastic demand, the, monot the company raises its price, and consumers stay, well, they must, they must uh, it's, as long as trade is voluntary, they must still agree that trade is mutually advantageous and they are getting a good deal because they're paying the price when they don't have to. Now, with a government monopoly, it's different. With a government monopoly, you have to pay. Uh, with a public school monopoly, if you don't pay your property tax, the government will take your house if, if it comes to that. Uh, I don't know if it was on Lou Rockwell's website or somewhere else I read recently. Uh, where was it, Lou? There was a, 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 a an elderly couple that uh, uh, inadvertently underpaid their property tax bill by three dollars, and they just totally forgot about it. It was totally, I mean, the bill might have come in the mail or that something happened, and uh, the local government actually started proceedings to uh, to uh, foreclose on their on their mortgage and take their house, sell their house to collect the $3 that, that, that they were owed. So with a government monopoly, and most of this money, of course, goes to the government school monopolies at the local level, if you say, I'm not going to pay, bad things can happen to you. But in any private monopoly, you can just thumb your nose at them and, and, and uh, you know, or give them, or whatever you want to do, give them the finger, you know, you know or something worse, throw water balloons at them. It's, you know, whatever you want to do, that, that, that's perfectly okay. Um, another uh, trenchant point, I think, uh, you know, we, we really are talking about price controls here. We're talking about antitrust policy. It's an attempt by government to impose price controls. And I, I would uh, recommend to all of you a short little article of mine on Mises.org called 4,000 Years of Price Control. It's, it's a book review of a book called 4,000 Years of Price Control. And it's a beginning with ancient Egypt. Uh, it's all about the disastrous uh, results of attempts to control prices by governments and that have created massive starvation in, in, in country after country after country, time after time, time and again. And that's essentially really what we're talking about here. We're talking about this crackdown on monopoly, so-called uh, uh, price controls. Another important point that is often overlooked, uh, always overlooked by uh, economists, mainstream economists, is the whole business about output restriction. Now the model sets up, here's nirvana, QC is nirvana. That's perfectly competitive equilibrium. And uh, the model says, aha, uh, this article where there's some market power, so-called, say this company just invented a brand new product that no one else has, monopoly. It's, uh, it's restricting output to QM. Well, uh, a good, this is a good example of the nirvana fallacy because what, what a, a lot of economists sometimes do is to say, well, the ideal situation would be if everyone shared this insight to create this new product and it gave you this result of QC being the quantity of output. And so, but not everyone shared it. So if we compare the actual output, QM to QC, there's a big output restriction there. But realistically, um, the real comparison ought to be comparing QM, the actual real world level of production, to zero, to what would happen had the insight not ever been developed and the product never been put on the market. So what you have is a net expansion in consumer welfare because the product exists. But what the typical uh, neoclassical economist will do will compare that output to nirvana, to the, to the situation where everybody shares this. Um, and uh, as one good example, when Microsoft was being um, persecuted by the federal government under the antitrust laws, uh, one of the proposals that this judge, uh, judge who was eventually fired, uh, made is he wanted Microsoft to uh, be forced by the government to share the source code for uh, Windows, with, put it up with everybody. It would be the equivalent of forcing Coca-Cola to publish the recipe for Coca-Cola on the Internet or something like that. And that fits in perfectly with this idea that, well, if everyone had this knowledge, uh, we would be in nirvana, perfectly competitive ideals. But, of course, if companies were forced to give away all their, their trade secrets like that, what would you forecast would be the effects on innovation and spending on R&D if you knew you spent $50 million on research and development 
And then as soon as you, you come upon a good product that you thought could make, make up that 50 million and more, the government would force you to share it with all your competitors. Who would invest that 50 million? It, it, you, only a fool would invest the 50 million if, they, if that would happen. And yet that's, that was one of the hearts, uh, heart, the heart of the antitrust case against Microsoft. That's what the competitors were after. They wanted to destroy Microsoft. Uh, and they almost did by, by having the government force them to share their, uh, their trade secrets. I wrote an article about that uh, also on Mises.org. If you look in my archives, uh, because uh, the, and the article was based on this judge's opinions, what, what he was saying, of what the ideal was, what he wanted to, ach to achieve. And uh, it, it was very Soviet central planning sounding. Uh, like. But on the subject of output restriction, you know, I, I live... Uh, I live and in, in, in work in Baltimore, Maryland, and there's a nice baseball stadium there, the Baltimore Orioles. It's a crappy team, but they, they play at this, and Camden Yard is a nice stadium. But the thing that I really dislike is they only pay, play uh, 166 games a year. And, uh, this, you know, and so they're, they're obviously restricting output. They only play, and, uh, and I, the thing I, I dislike even more is that the Baltimore Ravens, they only play eight or nine games a year at home. They have this big stadium there, and uh, eight or nine games. And, you know, football players are known for playing in any weather. So they could be playing football 12 months out of the year, but they, too, are restricting output because they only play 16 games a year. And to make the matters even worse, uh, professional boxers, uh, whoever the world champ is, I, I'm not, I don't follow boxing ever since... Uh, Muhammad Ali retired. I don't follow boxing that much, but uh, but they only box what once or twice a year. Whoever the world heavyweight champ is, obviously restricting output. You know, they should they should be fighting more like uh, uh, if you saw that movie, The Fight Club. Anybody ever see that movie? Those guys fought every night with bare knuckles. That's what prevent. That's now that's perfect competition. There they fought every every single night, and. Uh, and so the, the point I'm making is the point Murray Rothbard made is, 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 is again, what is this fetish about out, output restriction? It, it really is saying, once again, that there's, there's no scarcity in the world. Every, the production of everything is restricted compared to if you work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, of course you're restricting output. Uh, but who's to judge what the appropriate amount of uh, production is or, or not? Uh, I asked this question to a Federal Trade Commission bureaucrat at, a, at an antitrust conference in Washington, D.C. some years ago, and he was giving a rundown of, uh, of all the great things the Federal Trade Commission was doing for us consumers at the time. And one of the cases at the time that he said they were investigating was uh, Detroit auto dealers. He said that the Detroit auto, auto dealers in the winter months, in the cold weather, were shutting down in downtown Detroit at 5 p.m., and all of them. So if you wanted to buy a car after 5 p.m. in downtown Detroit in January, you're out of luck. You can't do it. They're all closed. And so naturally they, they smell the rat, the rat of out, output restriction and co price and conspiracy and collusion. And so uh, they, were, they were getting ready to, uh, to file a lawsuit against the uh, auto dealers. And, and I asked this guy, does that mean that uh, economic efficiency requires forced labor? Uh, or slavery, because after all, what would you call it if you told these people, you want to go home at 5 o'clock? No, no way, you have to work four more hours, or else we will drive you out of business. What else would you call that but forced labor? And so uh, he didn't have an answer, because obviously the answer was yes. Uh, you know, he couldn't, <laughs> couldn't stand up there and say, well, yeah, I'm a, slavery is fine if it's, if it's done in the name of antitrust policy, if we call it if we, if we call it slavery, it's a bad idea, but if we call it antitrust policy, maybe we can get away with it. And so, uh, and so that's, uh, that's the sort of the absurdities you get into when you take this idea seriously. Uh, the, the idea that someone knows what the perfectly competitive ideal uh, uh, amount of output is, it's the nirvana fallacy. It's the pretense of knowledge. The, 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 this is not knowable. We, 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 don't, we don't know this, uh, this number out there. The final point that, that I'll mention that I have time for in, in Rothbard's uh, chapter is, uh, is, uh, is the point that uh, when he talks about cartels, uh, uh, ask yourself this question. What is the difference really between what we think of as a cartel or a conspiracy between businesses, collusion, and a corporation or a business partnership? 
When people form a business partnership, they're colluding, aren't they, to do business just working with themselves and not with other people. They're, they're, you know, you could call it collusion. Collusion is a loaded term, by the way. So, you know, why is it different that if you get two businesses together and say, well, why don't we cooperate and sell television sets together, us, you know, us, the four of us, rather than just you two and then us two over here? Uh, it's, it's, it's not that much of a different thing. It's, it's pretty much the same, uh, same sort of thing. And, and one of the, what this all comes down to is uh, property rights and that this, the laws and the regulations regarding mergers and collusion is, uh, do, you, you know, do you believe uh, that property rights and freedom of association are a good thing or don't you? If you do believe property rights and freedom of association are a good thing, you should leave these people alone. Uh, don't, don't regulate their business activities when they band together or cooperate together. Uh, but if you're in favor of antitrust regulation to do something about this, well, you are implicitly saying property rights and freedom of association uh, might be a good idea for me, but not for people who are in business. That, that's, that's, that's not for me because I'm the consumer after all. I'm king. Uh, and so you know, we have to get the government to, to do everything he can for me. And so uh, that, that's the way I think about this is it's all a matter of uh, uh, property rights and freedom of association. And, and Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, that one of the most famous uh, statements, as I can paraphrase it, he said, uh, businessmen seldom meet even in merriment when the conversation doesn't inevitably turn towards some conspiracy against the public. It's a famous quotation, price-fixing conspiracy. The very next sentence, though, in The Wealth of Nations, uh, he says, uh, but no law could be made that would be consistent with liberty or justice that would prohibit this. They could, they could keep you know, business people from trying to sell their own private property in whatever way they can, you know, as long as it's voluntary and no force or violence or fraud is used. Uh, no law would be consistent with liberty or justice that, that would interfere with this. And I think that's about all the time I have for now. We might have a few minutes for a few questions. Okay? And that's it. Yes, sir. Since I've only lived in this country, are there some other countries that don't have antitrust uh, laws that uh, illustrate how getting by without them? Uh, well, you know, Canada only developed antitrust laws in the 90s, I know, because uh, I was up there. I was giving a talk at the University of Montreal. It was probably, uh, I don't know, the early 90s, and they were debating introducing any antitrust laws in, in Canada. And so uh, uh, Japan uh, Japan doesn't have uh, any, any antitrust laws to, to speak of. I think they just recently adopted some. But, uh, you know, Mitsubishi, I think the Mitsubishi Corporation is a conglomerate of about 800 different companies. And there's no way the Mitsubishi could have existed in America in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. The merger laws would not have allowed, and Mitsubishi involves uh, uh, insurance companies, automobile parts manufacturers, you know, it's not just it's banks, it's not just uh, like an automobile company. But they decided that's, that's their way of creating this, these products, Mitsubishi automobiles, uh, and making them competitive on world markets. And who can argue with that? And the same with Toyota and, and, and Nissan and, and, and the rest. And there's no way in the world. And this is why even uh, leftists like Lester Thoreau, the MIT economist Lester Thoreau, wrote a book about 20 years ago. And he's a big liberal uh, you know, left in, in the American sense. And he advocated the abolition of antitrust laws altogether so that American companies can compete with uh, Japan and Germany and, and other businesses in the car industry and elsewhere. And so yeah, Japan would be a good example of, uh, of uh, uh, a country that wasn't inhibited for many, many years by antitrust laws uh, like, like American companies have, uh, especially this fear of mergers. And by the way, a lot of, uh, antitrust... Uh, uh, well, one of the one of the articles that I that I published uh, back when uh, maybe before most of you were in diapers even was uh, I know I only look about twenty but uh, <laughs> I've been around a while I had my PhD when I was ten right uh, Mark knows about that but um, uh, it was called the origins of antitrust an interest group perspective it was in the International Review of Law and Economics in 1984 I think it was or 85 and. Uh, and it struck me that uh, this whole story about the origins of antitrust um, being a, a response to market failure, where the, gov uh, the markets were being monopolized and the government came in riding on a white horse 
and, and, uh, and, and reined in the monopolists of the late 19th century. I'd never seen any data on that. I, I'd, I'd always read this story in all the books. I was an economics major in college. I had a PhD, I was writing as a professor. And uh, sure enough, no one had ever actually demonstrated that this is, was actually happening. And so I gathered what data I could, and, uh, and I found that all these industries that were being accused of being monopolies at the time, uh, they were all dropping their prices faster than the, uh, the consumer product price index was going down in a period of deflation in the late, late 1880s uh, in the United States, and they were all expanding production tremendously. So even by the criterion of the new, new neoclassical model, these, these companies were super competitive. And so my conclusion is that antitrust has always been a protectionist racket. It has, it has always, from the very beginning, been used by non-competitive companies to harass their more successful competitors. And America has been plagued by that for over 100 years. And it's a blessing that the Japanese uh, business community that they weren't plagued by that. And uh, it's a curse to Canada that they adopted these things uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, and as soon as uh, communism fell, all the same economists like Frederick Shearer and these people all signed up as high-paid consultants to the World Bank and, and other institutions to go and advise all the former communist countries to adopt antitrust laws with them as their advisors on how to centrally plan their industries. And so I know uh, the late Mansur Olson at the uh, uh, University of Maryland, uh, I remember running into him once after he got uh, 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 I think $8 million, uh, a grant for $8 million to advise the European, the uh, Eastern European countries how to regulate their industries, you know, among other things. And so, and so, uh, you know, so, you know, so, so we're spreading this curse around the world with, uh, with our government money. Uh, time is up. Okay. Thanks.